coming to you from Orange County, California. This is the Jug Life Podcast with Max Ada and Chad Wesley Smith. Hey everybody, Chad Wesley Smith here bringing you another episode of the Jug Life Podcast. Today we are in Houston, Texas. I'm joined as always by mystical Max <laughs> Montana and our guest today, a, uh, a true personal hero of mine, Mr. Adam Nelson. How you doing, buddy? Doing great, Chad. Thanks for having me. Today's episode is brought to you by Chocolate Puddin' and Shot Puddin'. It's a lifestyle. <laughs> and uh, we got a lot of stuff to talk about with Adam, uh, so we'll just jump right into it. Uh, as I already mentioned, a, a personal hero of, of mine, I met Adam for the first time. I was a wee 16-year-old uh, at Junior Nationals in Palo Alto at Stanford, uh, and Adam was there competing at Senior Nationals. And you know, we're kind of back in this athlete staging area, and I'm I'm walking, and I tap my dad, and I'm like, Dad, it's it's Adam Nelson. Like, I gotta get a picture with him. And and this was not, you know, now you go to Expo, you go whatever, and you, and you can take pictures with people easily. We we had to. You know, set up like the hood kind of thing, but <laughs> it may have been with a disposable camera actually. But got, but got this picture with him, and it was like so so cool uh, that you know this big track star like would take a picture with me, especially because I either five minutes before or five minutes after yeah. I tried to stop Mo Green, and he just walked past me. But uh, <laughs> the, uh, so I had that picture pinned up pinned up on my bulletin board through all of high school and and. For a short shot putter, it was like Adam Nelson. That's my guy, and you get all fired up. But we'll talk more about that. Uh, so I'll, I'll not be too giddy fanboying as as we go. But but just know, even if if you may fanboy over me or Max at a at an expo, that we do the same thing to people as well. Um, so a bit about your resume. I'll I'll kind of toot your horn for you. Not like kinda that. Weird. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I know, I said I'm a big fan, but <laughs> yeah. So you are the 2004 Olympic gold medalist, the 2005 world champion, a Olympic silver medalist as well in 2000, and a four-time world silver medalist between indoors and outdoors with the PR 2251, mm -hmm. right? Which is 70... 73, 10, and three quarters, I think. 73, 10, and three quarters, which I know when you when you had retired from throwing that was like 10th farthest throw of all time. Right? Yeah, I think at the time it was like the sixth, fifth or sixth farthest. Uh, since then we've had a few guys pass me on that one. So. And the, uh, I, I looked at that a list of that this morning. A lot of failed drug tests on the, on the list in front of you or, or East Germans. Yeah, same, <laughs> same, same. <laughs> um, the, uh, so tell us a little bit about your, your background in the, in the sport and you know, what our meathead fans want to know about this freaky ass lifting and jumping that you're able to do. Yeah, so it's, thanks for having me. This is, this is gonna be a lot of fun. I, I, I always enjoy talking to Chad, especially when uh, he gives you sort of the color on what, how he really tried to stalk Mo Green. What he didn't <laughs> tell you was that Mo Green was lined up at the 100 meters and he was kind of outside, so that's why he ran by him. Um, but, uh, no, so I got involved with, with track and field, with throwing specifically, because I got cut from the baseball team in eighth grade, and it was an awesome opportunity for me to sort of pivot and, and find the weight room. I didn't really realize at that time uh, that that was going to be where it took me, but uh, I was really trying to get ready for football at the time. And my dad basically said, when I got cut from baseball, he said, you can uh, get a job or find something else after school. Well, track had a no-cut policy, so I thought I was pulling one over on my dad. Um, Anyway, uh, got into the weight room, and I was that weird kid that could spend hours in the weight room every single day, uh, starting at 12 years old. And uh, I probably spent more time under the bar, totally ignorantly, complete ignorance, uh, from 12 to 17 than anybody 10 years, uh, 10 years older or w over 10 years. I was there every single day, two to three hours a day. And if I didn't walk out of the place completely flamed, I didn't think I had a good workout. I remember having this conversation at, at dinner at the Sornex. You were mm -hmm. doing like 
German volume type of training, like 10 by 10? Yeah, so For it's, everything? Yeah, pretty much, <laughs> pretty much. Uh, so uh, I'd, I'd somehow, like, you know, in, in 1988 or 89, there wasn't a lot of information that you could get your hands on. So, and I was in Georgia, which, you know, it's, it was even farther behind than the rest of the world, just because <laughs> that's how we are. We like our, we like our traditions of ignorance sometimes, um, not to get into social commentary. Uh, but um, I found, you know, this really awesome wealth of information, uh, Joe Weider's magazines, basically. <laughs> and uh, there was this thing, and I've now learned that they are called uh, info advertisements, uh, that was advertising, oh, this guy got super huge and big on this program, and it was German volume training, basically. Uh, and I thought it was, like, cool. So the thing that I glommed on to as a 12-year-old uh, was this 10 by 10 and 50%. I had no idea what my max was, so I just did 10 by 10. And if I couldn't do, I'd, on the 10th rep, like the 10th set, if I wasn't failing on the 10th rep or 8th rep or whatever, then I just, you know, wasn't working hard enough. So 10, 10 rep maxes in a row. Yeah, yeah. 10, 10 rep maxes. <laughs> um, and I would do it, and I just remember, like, uh, so I, I, I always tell people my greatest strength as an athlete was not necessarily my ability to throw necessarily. It was my ability to endure horrible training without getting hurt for long periods of time. And so, but let me tell you something. Like, if you do a 10 by 10 program and you start at 50%, and then you go to 55 and 9 by 9, and then 68 by, uh, 68 by 8, and then I think at 7 by 7, I didn't think I was working enough, so then I would do, like, 10 by 7 and, then 10, and so on, and you keep progressing in that fashion. There is. He, a, he completed the eight by eight. Max and I are both, sure, yeah. are both convinced that it's actually impossible because we've ha both tried to do these eight by eight squat or bench workouts, and every time miss the sixty fourth rep of it. So oh yeah, that's yeah. that's no. why you're an Olympic gold well, medalist. Or not? I guess. I, I would do them twice a week. <laughs> I had a great split, uh, upper lower, um, and my lower workout. So um, I was fortunate enough that my dad had a real weight room uh, as well, yeah. and. Um, so when I would train at home, I'd train either in this little garage gym that we had in the, in, at our high school or in our, our basement gym. Um, either way, we had more or less the same equipment, which uh, actually our equipment at home was probably nicer than our equipment at the school. But um, I would do, uh, this was my circuit that I would do for my leg day. I would do back squat, then front squat, then sissy squats, which for those of you who don't know what sissy squats are, because I think they've been permanently banned or removed from all historical <laughs> text. Um, the way I interpreted it, and I'm going to have to do a demo here, Shorty, sorry about this, was I would hold the rack and lean back like this and then come back up. So it's like the best way to get, you know, massive quads, right? At least that's what I thought. And so I do that. So it's, it's 10 squats, 10 front squats, 10 sissy squats, uh, 10 hack squats on the hack squat machine, and 10 leg presses. That was one set. So like, Ten sets of that. yeah, yeah, it was 500 reps. I mean, like... <laughs> So I, I, was, I was really good uh, at, uh, at enduring a lot of really horrible training. But there was a progression to it, whether or not it was like science-based or not. It got heavier. And I found myself my senior year, <clears throat> we did a squat rep test um, in high school for football at the beginning of the year. And I did, uh, we did it at 225, and I did it for 85 reps. And I remember stopping on the 85th rep and being like, I really, and this is like four minutes of actual work time, five minutes, you're just going, shh, shh, and you have to do, go down to a, to a rope. And I remember like stopping and being like, okay, I've been doing this for a solid four and a half minutes. I think I'm done. And I think, <laughs> but I think I could have done, I, I, you know, in hindsight now, this is probably, I think in hindsight, I probably could have done 100, but I don't know why I stopped. Um, was but there we a did moment in that four minutes where you were worried that maybe some other kid might pass you? Like, well, so my goal shit, was to I hope, double. I hope somebody in like fourth period doesn't get 100 or 86. So we, no, we had we actually had a kid get 42. Uh, another kid get 42. We actually a lot of our, a lot of our guys got in the weight room, and so we had a kid get 42. And I don't know, you know, maybe the depth wasn't as as low as as low as it probably could have been. So maybe these were quarter squats. I remember them being like ass to the ground, you know. So I think but, uh, doubling him is a that's yeah. a proper level of, of yeah. shaming. Yeah. Uh, then so, we ran out and ran the forty. Uh, two right hours later, yeah. we ran a four oh. seven forty. It was awesome. So wh how long after was your double hamstring tear repair surgery? N I've never. <laughs> yeah. Well, these are actually not my legs anymore. I was. <laughs> uh, oh, no. it's bi it's bionic. Okay. <laughs> Um, so that, that takes you <clears throat> to Dartmouth, mm -hmm. and you're playing football and track at, at right. doing track at Dartmouth, right? 
Yeah, no, I, I did football and track at Dartmouth, and uh, it was one of the reasons why I went to Dartmouth was like the I was being recruited for football by a bunch of big schools and for track by a bunch of big schools, and none of them wanted me to do both uh, or would allow me to do both if it was a scholarship school. So I went up to Dartmouth, and I really loved the school there. Uh, they had a great football program, great uh, track program, and it's a great school. And they let me do both. And I remember making a deal with the coaches early on saying, look, I'm going to do both. And the first team that asked me to quit the other sport is the sport that I'm actually going to quit. So I, I only had one conversation my sophomore year where we got into a really gray area with my football coach um, where he wanted me to come out for spring ball. And I, I said, I tell you what, if I ever come in, because I was a cocky little shit, uh, I said, uh, I said, if I ever come back weaker or slower than anybody in my position, I'll do your programs and I'll come out for spring ball. Yeah. It never came close to happening. It was, a, I mean, it, it, I knew the bet. I, I took it because I knew it was almost, like, aside from a ma major catastrophe, yeah. like, I, there was no way that I would be weaker or, or slower than anybody else in my position. So, to that <laughs> effect of strength and, and speed, what, what are some of the best numbers through your whole through your whole track career, lifting, jumping, sprinting? Yeah, so um, I tested in a vertical jump. I tested at the 2000 Olympics uh, in Sydney at 39 and a half inches. And you were, weighing, you were about Two, five, 262, 257, yeah. somewhere in that range. 5'11", 260. Um, six feet, come on. Look. Six feet. You're kind of sitting up. I'm, my, <laughs> I'm sinking down on the couch more because of my... My advanced weight, but okay. Six foot. Yeah, yeah. Well, it's a gentleman's six is what we call it. Gentleman's six. Um, so um, 39, 39, 39 and a half inches at the 2000 Olympics. Uh, I did that with Judd Logan. We did some box jumps afterwards, and um, that was a, I was a pretty good jumper there. I mean, routinely, I was well over 10, 4, 10, 5, 10, 6 with a, with a, with a standing broad jump. Um, on a good day, I might even be able to push up to 11. I don't really remember exactly what I did. Um, I could, uh, you know, standing triple jumps, so broad, three broad jumps in a row. Uh, that was easily over 32 feet when I got going with him. Um, never quite got up to the 60 foot on the five jump. That was what uh, Koji Morifushi was mm. legendary for being able to do the five broad jumps over 60 feet every single time he did it. And I, I just never could do that. I couldn't carry it through the fourth jump. but. Um, but uh, bench press, 585. I did, uh, uh, let's see, 225 for 42 reps when I was a senior in high school. And I did it for 47 reps uh, sometime in college. I don't remember exactly what year. Who would have thought that the 500 rep workout would have made you good at reps? Seriously, <laughs> I, 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 I could do reps. <laughs> I, I was much better at reps than anything else. I did one in the cleans. I had power, power cleans, and I had horrible techniques, still do. I did uh, 185 for... A uh, double, 190 for a double. Never Kil did kilos a single. Kilos now, we're talking yeah. kilos. Sorry, switched, uh, <laughs> metric, switched to the metric system. Uh, squats, best squat work ever. I never really worked up to any heavy singles in any lift, really. It just wasn't what I did. But I did 665 for a set of, uh, for a set of 10, and that's one of my, my favorite stories of all time because my college coach, my senior year, was like, we're going to – he set this up. He's like for – a month or it's like five or six weeks we were going to go over 600 pounds every squat workout yeah. and the goal was to do five sets over 600 pounds and i'd worked up i'd done like you know 615 for a set of five or six or something like that or 635 for a set of five at the time and um but only one set and so the first week we do like 600 or 605 or 615 for you know whatever the set, set of five and then the next it's like two sets, 615, 625, or 615, 635. I forget exactly what the progression was now. But the last, uh, the last workout, he comes and he says, okay, and this is true juggernaut style. We're going to do a plus set, right? Uh -huh. <laughs> but we didn't know what it was. He's like, you're just going to do as many as you can. This is 1990, um, 1997. And um, you're going to do as many reps as you can, and it's going to be 665. Now, keep in mind... The weight room that I worked out in had a the squat rack that I was using was one of these three level tri level yeah, squat yeah. racks, classic, um, handmade by as most of them were, but like this was actually handmade by the guys in the machine shop like next door, so that it could also it was on hinges so it could fold up against the wall. Oh, sure. So I was probably pushing the safe limit of, <laughs> of this rack, <laughs> and so like. I remember when I did this, I did this, my coach calls the whole team in and we're talking about a room that's smaller than the room we're in now. And there's a little rack against the wall and he goes, he goes, okay, 
you're going <laughs> to, you ready? Let's go. And he, he used to do this thing where he'd pop your traps. So he'd take the, these big old meat hooks of hands, he'd grab your traps and pop them, which of course just pisses you off because it hurts mm -hmm. like hell. And um, I'd get under there, get set, and I go, and I'm like, he's like, get the first five reps, and it's like, no problem. He's like, two more! He, he, doesn't, he doesn't tell me when I'm on. He said, I'm going to tell you when to stop, but I'm going to tell you keep going. He's like, like, two more! So I said, okay, okay, coach. And I get six, then seven, and then he's like, three more! And I'm like, okay, coach! You know, I'm like ready to fucking kill people, right? I'm like, all right! I feel the blood vessels in my head go, boom, 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 boom. You don't know how like, blood vessels in your eyes. I just start going. You're like, yeah, that's right. That's, I'm seeing red everywhere now. My face is beat red. I got the mirror in front of me that's like, you know, from TJ Maxx or something like that. So this whole, ra anyway. And then I'm hitting that, that go eight, nine, ten. And he goes, two more? Like, he's like, I don't know. <laughs> Where's this going to stop? And I was like, fuck you. And I collapsed and <laughs> so uh, I think uh, aside from that, I think I did work up to 7:35 for a set of uh, set of five with Charles one time, but um, and we did some limited range of motion stuff that we got into the like um, he calls them isometronic workouts or isometronic movements, which is like the top th four to six inches of the lift, and we got over 900 a few times with that. But um, so like West Side it's kind of squat. <laughs> Wow, that was a dig, huh? Yeah, I enjoyed those. Um, I set it up well for yeah, you. Yeah, you did. Thank yeah. you. Yeah. The, uh, so I guess you're pretty strong and fast, I suppose. Um, so you're coming out of Dartmouth, you know, not a traditional track powerhouse, Ivy League school. How far did you throw in college? Uh, my senior year, I threw 63-2, one NCAAs. Yeah, I timed it well. Um, <laughs> the year before, I took 67 feet, and the year before that was John Cadena's record this 72 this year did you see it? holy stupid. shit the, these kids are like getting up there on the shot foot no. I, I timed it well <laughs> yeah. timing is everything and so you graduated college in 97 yeah, yeah and i had one more indoor season of eligibility in 98 that i went back for um and then I moved out to california so throwing as a as a post-collegiate yeah you know, th this time it was certainly the the trickiest time for me trying to trying to compete as a post-collegiate i'm sure for for track athletes, for you know, weightlifters, for any anyone chasing the Olympic dream, that time where you, you come out of college, so you don't have the NCAA support, but you're not good enough yet to get the 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 big you know the the millions of dollars uh, that you know all the coupon codes are going to generate for people <laughs> these days, but to get like a real support and sponsorship. So that ni 98 to 2000. Uh, or even through 2000, through making the first Olympics. Tell us about that time, the life of a pro track and field athlete. Yeah, uh, so I was lucky in that I had a friend that had moved out to California the year before um, and said, hey, look, we've got a great place where you can train, um, and i got a room for you. And so I remember packing up my stuff and driving across country from New Hampshire out to San Francisco and training at Stanford and pulling up to this house, and they like pointed me, like, here's your room, and it was a closet underneath the stairs. But it was for two hundred dollars a month, and you're you you you're kind of in that oh, area, yeah. Chad. Yeah, yeah. So you know, like, <laughs> even in nineteen ninety eight, two hundred dollars a month is super cheap. So that's a steal. Um, you know, it, it didn't matter that it wasn't insulated; it was on the front of the house, and it didn't matter that there was a stairway that went over the top. And so I woke up or heard everything. And, like and there were you were one of eleven. Yeah, there were eleven other athletes all training in that, and it was, you know, in hindsight, I look back and I'm like, man, I think I was either you know, just blinded by my own ambition so much that I didn't realize how much that sucked. Um, but it just seemed like, it just seemed like what you do. Like, yeah. uh, and that's sort of the expectation for Olympic hopefuls at the time. Uh, you know, you just, oh, well, it's a struggle. And they tell you, this is the struggle. Um, and so when I moved out there, I was like, well, this is what I've chosen to do. So there was never any doubt or never any, I was like, well, this is just what I'm, if I'm not willing to put, put up with this or deal with this, then I clearly don't want it enough. And there were other guys who made the Olympics from living in that house as well. Jamie Nieto was he in there? Or? Uh, no, Jamie wasn't. Uh, we had we had uh, so we had we had, well Alex Galantakis uh, was on a couple Greek national teams uh, for the discus. Uh, there were a couple of guys that made a couple of national teams, but ultimately uh, I was actually the only one that made the the, the Olympic team. We had a couple. Did you people. move up to the master bedroom then? No, it didn't work uh -huh. like that. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> it was the first in. 
first in, uh, first in, first out, and then and then the, whoever was the first in got the uh, got the got the yeah. choice uh, after that. So, um, but it didn't work like that. But it, you know, it was it sucked. But at the end of the day, like I was, it was a shared experience with a lot of people, and I think that's one thing that uh, maybe this this generation sometimes lacks is a community of shared experiences because so much of our stuff is is online but how long were you in that room uh we were there for a little over a year and then we moved into another place and i lived in a garage that i converted so um step up from the stairwell it was more space anyway yeah, yeah. and and were you training full-time were you also working and yeah so i was working in training when i first got out there so uh, when I when I finished Dartmouth, I had all these opportunities to go to New York and do all these you know fancy pants jobs, wear a suit for a living, and and get really old really quickly. Adam's really smart, by the way. In case you weren't catching that from the Dartmouth and everything like that, but um, thank you. Um, but uh, I I wanted to kind of I I didn't want to forego or or postpone all of that. So I found I thought I could do like a. a uh, financial services, private wealth management kind of job, which would be based more around market hours, and market hours on the east, on the west coast are pretty early, uh, like 6 a.m. to to 2 or 3 p.m. Uh, so it's like, oh, this would be perfect. I'll get in early and get out relatively early and be able to train in the afternoons. Uh, as it evolved, they want you to do more than just the normal, you know, eight or nine hours, and and so I worked, uh, you know. I've, I worked from basically, I got used to get into work at about 5.30 and uh, would get out about 6, take a quick break, go change clothes, go train and be out of my train, be out and finish with training by about 12 uh, every night. And that's just what I did. Um, I was, again, young enough that, you know, getting three or four hours of sleep a night. Um, and, you know, I know what the science says, that there's no such thing as a sleep camel. Like, you can't store it up on the weekends. <laughs> But eh, <laughs> I think it worked okay. Um, but no, it wasn't sustainable. I started getting injuries and started having like yeah. some chinks in my armor that I'd never experienced. And so I, uh, after a little over a year there, I, I, I quit that job uh, and was able to find a job with an internet company that allowed me to work and train for work from home. Uh, gave me a lot more flexibility to schedule too. So it was like, like I still work probably 50 or 60 hours a week, but. Um, I was actually able to do it on my own time and work on the weekends and stuff like that too when I had it. So that made it, that made life a little easier. So we got 50 plus hour work weeks, living in the closet and then upgrade to the garage, training until midnight. And that comes into the year 2000 and this meteoric rise into, yeah. into the Olympics or the Olympic trials. T take us through those couple meets. Yeah, so, well, let me go back. The best thing that ever happened to me was actually tearing my pec in 1999. At the end of 99, I tore my pec during a, I, it was just totally random. I was warming up uh, on the, and I, I was on the six rep of 385 in my warm up, and I was just coming right through out of the bottom, and I just felt pop, 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 pop. And I finished the rep, looked around, said, shit, I just tore my pec. Never, never torn anything. I uh, went to see a doctor, and um, he said, he said, hey, uh, you're going to have to have surgery. I said, well, what does that mean? He said, well, you're done for six or eight months or whatever it is. You won't be ready for the trials. I'm like, nah, okay. And then as I was leaving, he said, well, you could also try rehabbing it. And if you rehab it, you might be able to load it within three or four months. I'm like, dude, I'm just like, this is a no-brainer to me. I'm, just, I'm all in. <laughs> And so what it did was force me to change the way I train. And so I'd always been under the bar so much that I, and, and just because I loved it, the weight room's so instantly gratifying that it's like, it, it is a drug uh, and, and an addictive one. Um, it's, and so like, I just love to grind. I love to get under the bar and it forced me to get out from under the bar. That's when I started really define, like, so the way I look at it is like, I spent like the first eight or 10 years of my training career as lifting, like building this massive base and never truly realizing how to, how to get that super compensation. So when I actually came out, I didn't realize I was actually probably overtrained for most of my, most of my career. Early you, were still, on. you were probably still overtrained from the 500 rep workouts in high school. Yeah. You know, <laughs> six years later. So, uh, <laughs> so when I started doing stuff that was like unloaded but super fast because that's all I could do, like all of a sudden I went from like, like I mean, my, my 40 time got down to like, not that this has a huge correlation with shot put, but I was like running like four fives and four 
four five fours in my 40 and my vert my broad jumps just went through the roof i remember we'd do like a three-step long jump competition with my training partner and we'd routinely go like 19 feet with it you know so we like all of a sudden like right. all this stuff started happening then i i wasn't able to throw until march of that year and uh i went out and started throwing the 4k which is the the women's shot so and march of 99 or march of 2000 march of 2000 yeah so march so, of 2000 for the 2000 olympics those are in the summer. March and the summer are not very far apart. <laughs> yeah. So I go out and I take my first throws. I'm like, wow, that actually feels pretty good. And then within the month, I'm doing full stand throws with the, uh, with the, uh, with the 15 pound shot and the 16 pound shot. And they're going farther than they ever had. I'm like, what just happened here? Like, yeah. um, and, uh, then, uh, I start doing full throws and, and at the end of March, first of April, uh, of that year in like my first full throws were like, three feet farther than what I would normally throw in a, in a practice. And I'm like, this is unbelievable. And then from like literally April, May, and June, if I showed you my progression of distances, I literally went from like 65 to 66 feet on average to like my best throws of practices being honestly immeasurable in the facility that I was training in because I was hitting the fence. And you know that little, mm -hmm. the outside se the outside the sector circle at the uh, shop at sector at, at Stanford, yeah. I would hit the fence two or three feet up with the 15s, I always train with the light shots, but the, the 14 the 15 uh, foot, the 14 and 15 pound shots, and I threw several down the right-hand side, which is the short side there, over the fence, down into the hammer sector. So like, I was like, I don't know how far I'm gonna throw, um, but I didn't care, I was, like, I was just so happy that like, I could actually throw. And then uh, I got invited to this, this meet in North Carolina, um, and it was my first pro meet. And, and so I was, I was super fired up. They called me on, a, on like a Tuesday and said, hey, can you come to North Carolina? I'm like, yeah, sure. And like, well, when do you need me there? Well, we're, we got a flight out for you Wednesday night. So I took a red eye from California to, to, to Raleigh um, and, um, and got there. And I was like, okay, I'm here. And I'm walking in this hotel and I see two of my competitors, Andy Bloom and Kevin Toth, talking about who's gonna make the Olympic trials, who's gonna make the Olympic team, who's gonna be a threat there. And they named, they're, they, they're continuing their conversation after I say hello, and they name like five people, and none of them are me. And I look at them, and I'm like, guys, I'm standing right here. I literally said, guys, I'm standing like right here. What was, what, what's, and they literally said, well, you're on the bubble. And I looked at him, and I said, y'all just made the biggest fucking mistake of your life. And I went upstairs, I was pissed. And so uh, the next day I went out, and that was my first big throw. I threw 70 feet, I think, seven inches or something like that um, uh, that next day and beat all those guys only lost to CJ Hunter who had to PR to beat me CJ was the defending world champion or was a world champion at the time um, and uh, that was it it was pure like it was the final straw it was like that little boost of yeah. anger and spite that gives you the superhuman powers you know like um, and then I kind of rode that wave through through uh, through the trials um, so and so you had you had several meets where you PR'd like back to back to back, right? Mm -hmm. Three meets in a row, uh, four, actually four meets because it started off at a little all comers meet at Los Gatos, where I went from um, I think I ended up throwing like sixty seven ten, but I had a couple fouls like right at like seventy feet, and then I went to seventy feet seven or whatever it was in in Raleigh, maybe in seventy feet four, and then um, I went uh, a little bit farther at the Stanford meet uh, leading up to the trials, and then through a, a big PR. Uh, at the 2000 Olympic trials, which was a, I think it still is the Olympic trials record at 2212 or 72 feet, seven inches. So T talk to me about this, th this moment here. Oh yeah. So, um, you want to pause it for just a second? So the, like the two, the way the trials work is they take the top three, uh, from the event. So the top three go on to, uh, go on to the Olympics. And our event is so stacked, literally like the top six or seven people could go on and, and really be medal contenders for any other country. Yeah, um, over like the last 15, 20 years, any given year on the low end, would be, America would have like five of the top 10, 11 shot putters in the world. On the high end, maybe seven or eight of the top 11 or 12. So I, I'm, I'm walking into this, like the fifth round, uh, so... I basically walked into the final round, and C.J. Hunter, I think, was ahead of me. Um, Andy Bloom was ahead of me. Or Ke no, C.J. C.J. was the only one ahead of me, I think, at the time. I think I was in second at the time. 
and, and we had John Godina, a three-time world champion, still throwing, and he was having a little bit of an off day. Uh, Andy Bloom, who'd won NCAAs the year before me and was a silver, silver or bronze medalist in the world championships a couple years before. Uh, Kevin Toth, all these guys that had huge PRs of over 70 feet were all kind of lining up for this big, huge final push to make this team. And Andy goes out there and, and, and launches one and PRs and makes, like, confirms his spot on the team as the fifth, like he was fifth and he turn, goes, into, goes into first. Um, and so I bumped down into third position. Um, so again, I'm on the bubble, so to speak, because good, John Godina's uh, coming in for his final throw and he's a three-time world champion and everybody's like, he is going to make yeah. this team. Uh, and he goes out and I think he fouls. And so, and then I'm up and I'm like, I know I've already made the team. Now it's just what position am I going to go in? And it was one of those moments, like I still get like goosebumps when I think about it. Like um, you, when, when I go into the circle, like I, I don't know who I become or who I really am, but like at the moment the world just stops. And like, um, that was your first round throw. Um, and, um, and uh this Chad showing the, the competition here, but um, this is it right here. That's Andy throwing his PR. Yeah. So I'm once John takes this throw here, I know I've actually made the team, but it's just a question of how far, how what position I'm going to be. And this is just one of those moments where you know you find the, mo the find you 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 find that 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 energy and that you get into the zone. And I just remember stepping in the circle, the world just went completely quiet and I was so locked in on this one specific task of throwing the shot put. And uh, when I finally exploded back to life, like the shot put came down and it was an Olympic trials record and I found myself throwing 72 feet, seven inches. I'd won the trials and was now the uh, favorite going into the 2000 Olympics. And Andy's like 6'2", so I almost jumped over him on that. <laughs> so th this is a, a good time to, to talk about something that we we're going to talk about later, but, but this controlled aggression. And anyone who, who watched you through your track career, you know, there's Adam Nelson and there's, there's Nelly. And you'd flip this switch and, and you're a, a great showman and, and all this stuff, but the shot put is very technical. Like it, it, it's, it's a very fine line to, to walk how aggressive can you be? How fired up can you be? But how can you also focus on your technique? And that's what I think powerlifters, weightlifters, they struggle with. Can you talk about sort of harnessing that, that <coughs> controlled aggression? Yeah, so um, a lot of people have asked me about my pre-throw routine because I do get very excited, very fired up. And I think it all started, I don't know what age it was, but I mean, ever since I was a, you know, probably watched too many Rocky movies when I was growing up. I don't know what it was, but... Um, I just always felt like when you, if you can put yourself like into the moment and live specifically in that moment and have all your energy like focused on whatever that strength skill is, it was always strength for me because I thought, oh, that's what I, that's, that was where I was. And whether it was in wrestling or whether it was in football or whoever I was trying, whoever I was competing against or whatever the objective was, I knew that if I could like force myself to get so focused in that one moment that I just, I, I could do superhuman things. I always believe that we have superhuman powers. I know that's kind of crazy. Uh, but I read this book when I, I told you I was the weird kid that spent all these hours in the weight room under the bar. But I read this book in eighth grade uh, that was called The Athlete's Guide to Mental Training. And they talked a lot about visualization. And again, as an eighth grader, you don't necessarily get the full picture of things, but you glom on to certain things. So I always had this mental image of who I was when I was competing. Like, if you looked at me, like, like I'm six feet tall, six feet tall. <laughs> Six feet tall. Well, they shrink as they get older. So. <laughs> yeah, I said, I'm not, yeah, six feet tall. Um, and, uh, and, and anyway, but I always had this strong image of, of who I was. But if you looked at me in relative to my competitors, I was six feet tall, 257 to towards the end of my career, I got as heavy as 267 or 260, 268 with a couple of days over 270, which didn't feel good. Um, but uh, mostly somewhere around that 260 mark, and most of my competitors were, you know, 40 to 70 pounds bigger and three or four inches taller. So I never saw myself as smaller than they were. Like in my head, I was bigger than all of them. Um, and 
you're in 2000, the process was still a little bit raw and I got it, it was, it was refining and refining, but literally I would walk into a circle and I would see this superhuman version of myself, like do whatever it is that I was about to do. And eventually I got so good at it that it wasn't the superhuman version of myself. It was me stepping in and I could feel how this person was, how this person moved, what he thought. And like when I get into that character, when I get into that mode, and it really is an extension of who I am, but when, when I get into that mode, like there is nothing I can't do. And I, 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 there's no doubts. There's, there's just pure like what is the task at hand and I will, I'm, I'm going to crush it. There's nothing else in that hand in that mo- and, and that, that, that interferes with that. And over time... I started developing processes. I've worked with sports psychologists, sports hypnotherapists, and a bunch of other people to help refine this process. Uh, and in 2001, it kind of happened where like I fell into the right sort of like rhythm with it. Like how this is how I'm going to set it up now. We were at a meet in, uh, in Portland, Oregon, and it was uh, the shot put sector was outside of the track. And so we didn't have a lot of room to move around and the people were surrounding the shot put sector. And, um, so I, I went out into the sector, and I was like, I'm going to put on the show, one, because it helps me. Um, like, this is all, like, I want, if people aren't entertained by what we do, we are failing as performers. And I know a lot of people say, well, you're not a performer, you're an athlete. That's bullshit. You're both. And if you don't, if you don't know who you are when you perform, like, what you want the, what you want the, 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 the crowd to experience like, I want them to experience the greatness of throwing, the greatness of whatever it is that I'm doing. And while diehard fans can look at that and see our performance and be like, oh, that's awesome. We don't thrive or survive off the diehard fans. You thrive off being, like, transcending whatever the boundaries are that are set for you ahead of time. So that, that was my goal. It was like, how can I get that four-year-old kid to be excited about this? Well, shoot, I was a huge fan of WWF, when I, WWE, when I was little, Right like Hulk Hogan and, and the Macho Man Randy Savage and all those guys, you know, come on, you know, and it was all a show, right? Yeah. So this part of it was showmanship, like no joke, but the other part was I also knew that as I got super fired up and super excited, I had to take a little bit of steam off, like because I was, I was at too high. I needed to come down to like, you know, maybe 90% instead of like this 100%. So I'd get out there and I'd do my thing and get the clap going and the trigger for me to get into that <laughs> exactly uh, the, the the trigger for me the thing that I anchored it to uh anchored like this transition from from me to this superhuman version of myself was when I'd pull my shirt off so when the shirt would come off boom that was my trigger and it and and once you practice the act of anchoring like uh, a trigger like really like get that down you come into this person and that person does whatever it's been programmed to do. And so I was on autopilot at that point. And people are like, well, you look so fired up. I'm actually, I'm totally relaxed. Like, I could, like, if, if I stopped in that moment, I could have, like, I could be screaming. And then you could say, hey, uh, Adam, um, what do you think about this particular whatever it is? And I could literally say, this is an excellent question. It's not time for that right now. Let me take care of this. <laughs> and go right back into the zone. It would be that, that, like, that easy for me to do. Like, so I'm super, I'm actually super relaxed and it all, like, so I get fired up, fired up, pull the, and then I'm into that mode and I go into the, go into the circle. Once I set my feet, that's again, where I get to like the perf, that's like, like I need to be, that's where I need to be like whew, ice. And then, and then once I get into that mode, like it's, it's all, it takes care of itself. Was there times in, in practice where you got going like that? Um, so it's so in practice, no, because I needed to have more of a, a dialogue with my coach. I need to be a little bit more aware of my environment and just kind of work through things. But we create a plan, um, like, and we, I start executing. The closer I got to a major championship, the more I try to replicate whatever the major championship event was going to be like. Um, but I would practice this stuff. Like I would literally have, you know, spend an hour, um, at least an hour a week doing a guided. Uh, visualization or sports therapist session uh, with with people that I work with um, or or do I mean I'd probably spend I don't know maybe 30 to 45 minutes a day which people think that's not that much but when you're doing visualization you're really trying to get in the mode like spending 30 or 45 minutes when you're pretty good at it like that's a lot of time yeah. the mental reps that I was able to do during that time and the visual like the detail that I was ad- able to add to this person 
it's it's phenomenal, and that's that's really the secret of it. It's not a lot of people are like, oh, uh, that's that's kind of hokey. Like I, I do that stuff. I think I'm a, a giant. What does that giant look like? What does he wear? How does he enter the room? How does he interact with people? You're developing a character. So if I were to sit down and describe any one of you guys, if if I were doing a superficial job, I'd say, well, Chad is, you know, he's a big guy, handsome, beautiful eyes. Go on. Dreamy. Yes. <laughs> Cute little ears that are too small for his head. Well, it's, it, it, are the ears too small or is the head too big? Who really does. knows? You know? But, but my, my point is, like, it's the detail that matters. And it's the detail with everything that matters. When you're designing a training program, yeah. okay, anybody can throw down sets and reps on a, on, a, on a piece of paper. But it's the details of how you pull that all together. You leave, if you leave details undefined, it, it ends up creating an inefficiency in your programming or an unknown result. And so the more detail you can add to this character, and I mean, I never got to, I never, I actually, I probably should have in hindsight, but I never literally wrote down a full description of this character. It was all upstairs for me, all, all, all virtual, if you will. But like I would literally, I, I could tell you everything about this person. Um, I could tell you how, and then ultimately as I got more, it's, it's kind of like creating an a alternative personality. Um, so maybe, maybe that's the, the secret is to be mildly uh, schizophrenic or something like that. <laughs> I think the, the, the big takeaways there, I think, for a powerlifter, a weightlifter who wants to get, you know, who, who wants to ride this line of as fired up as they can be but not too fired up to disrupt their technique, I think is it's not for all the time in practice. Practice, yeah, right. you know, training is for, is for practicing the skill and you have to be a little bit more calm to do that. And if you were going full Nelly mode, you know, 10 times a week, you would have been really tired all the time, probably. Oh, I've been burnt out. I've been, <laughs> yeah. be overtrained mentally. Yeah. Like, uh, it, it takes its toll on you. And, you know, the powerlifter who's hitting the ammonia caps for their, you know, third deadlift warm-up is like the same, the same situation. And then, so, you know, use training for practicing the skill, not for putting on the show, and then having that, that trigger moment. So and Max and I talk all the time about you know, process orientation mm -hmm. and creating this you know, replicatable process for how you approach the bar for, for everything that you do. So what, you know, for you, it was when the shirt com comes off as, as you're stomping around the sector. You know, for, for the weightlifter, it might be as they stand at the back of the platform and tighten their belt or whatever it is that, that you gotta have some point where that moment can switch and yeah, you've got all the adrenaline flowing, but now you, you can harness it and, yeah. and use that energy uh, positively. It's like if you're an arm wrestling trucker and you know <laughs> that when you flip that hat around, there it That's is. That's a trigger. That's yeah, it. Exactly. There you go, right? Yes. <laughs> Perfect. <laughs> Perfect. So 2000 Olympics, silver medal. Let's, let's fast forward just because we've got so much stuff we're talking about here. To 2004. Uh, 2004 was my senior year in high school. Uh, you know, you'd, you'd, you'd already had the transformative experience of meeting me the year before. So, I mean, this is uh, true. Spurred you on here. <laughs> and, uh, and the most stacked, you know, one of the most stacked years the U.S. has ever had in the shot put. Olympic trials, Christian Cantwell, the five farthest throws in the world that year, doesn't even make the Olympic team. So, it's you, it's Reese. And it's Godina. Godina, yeah. And it's all, you know, Athens Olympics, the, the birthplace of the Olympics, the original location. And, and NBC's wanted to play up the shot put so much because, you know, America could sweep the medals is the talk. And they, they had the shot put off at this different venue, at the original Olympic venue. Mm -hmm. uh, so the only people there are there to watch the shot put. And there was a lot of people there to watch it and a really cool setup. And I'm at home watching, watching on TV. And it was very nerve-wracking as a fan. So <laughs> sort of, I, I guess it was, was tough for you too. But, but I was very stressed out at home watching on my couch because you, you foul a lot. You, that's I kind do. of your thing. Yeah, it so is. So Adam's throwing five fouls. You get six throws. And on foul, you step out of the ring. It goes I out of the second. and then four fouls. All right, yeah, yeah. I'm just overall. Okay. 69-6 about the, the best throw? 69-7 uh, or 6, yeah, it's yeah. more in there. And so you have 69-6, Yuri Bilinog from, from Ukraine, 69-6, tie. Well, the tie then goes to the second 
farthest throw, mm -hmm. of which you have defense. none. Yeah. So uh, again, it's one of those things where the last you only need one throw to win, and um, that was sort of my mantra. Like I knew one that time, one time, <laughs> and um, I, I, because I'd been leading the whole competition, and Yuri tied me on the on his last throw, his sixth throw of the competition. It was uh, 59th of 60 throws in a whole in a, in a competition. He tied me on the 59th throw of the competition overall amongst all the competitors. And uh, I knew going into the last throw that I had to throw farther to win. So this is, this sort of takes you back to those moments when you're playing on your uh, your driveway, you know, shooting hoops or whatever. Mm. Three seconds to win. <laughs> Inevitably, you know, you yeah. miss it. Uh, at least I did. That's why I got cut from basketball too. But uh, <laughs> anyway, um, but uh, this is like this is like that moment that like as an Olympic shot putter, you probably dream of if you could ever think about this sort of context. We're in the ancient, not just the original, but the ancient Olympic Stadium. First competition there in, in several thousand years, and it's the last competition they've had there. I guess we were uh, we were so good or so bad they never wanted well, to. Greece hasn't <laughs> Greece hasn't been doing great since those Olympics. Yeah, no, the, I think those Olympics may have pushed yeah. them over the edge actually. But um, step in the circle. I mean, I've been in this scenario so many times that I felt like this is this is my this is my environment. Like a small venue, um, relatively small. There were about twenty something, about twenty twenty thousand people there just to see the shot put. It was a very intimate setting. This is the type of thing that I I excel in. And the first throw of the day was super easy, and then in the next four throws things just fell apart. I'm not sure what happened, uh, but technically I was off. And I'd fallen, I'd dropped the shot, it slipped out of my hand. I mean, like everything that you can possibly have go wrong technically um, in a throwing competition, it was, it was all unfolding at that moment. And I was like, crap, this sucks. Um, and, and so I, I, but I remember going into the last throw, I was like, I feel really good. There was no doubt in my mind that I was gonna take this competition. Like there are times where you're like, man, I just don't have it. I was like, today it was like, I have it, I've just been off. Like I can't, like, and it's coming together. Each throw is getting better and better. I still was fouling, but it was okay. Step into the last throw, uh, and again, it's one of those moments where the world just stops. And there were people that were booing, the people that were cheering, because people don't like Americans. And depending on what side of the, you know, aisle you're on, so to speak, uh, they were they were expressing their opinions. Um, but I just I remember getting in a circle, and once that shot put touched my neck, like I could feel the hairs on the back of my neck stand up. I could feel like the world just stopped. I'm like, I'm here. I'm there, like this is this is the this is the moment that we all wait for, and and I don't really remember much as I'm moving through the circle, and then when it, when the shot put finally leaves, I, I just I just remember like the world just exploding back to life, and knowing that I just won the Olympics, and when I see the shot put land, it literally was about a foot and a half or two feet farther than any other throw of the day. I'm like I just you know this is that moment, I, I and I look up to the left and they raise a red flag, indicating that I fouled my last throw. And I see um, the Ukrainian athlete start taking his victory lap. And here I was, a uh, 2000 Olympic silver medalist. Uh, I, I should have won that one or should have thrown better. I won't say I should have won, but I, I should have thrown better than what I did there. I've been silver in 2001, silver in 2003, and now silver in 2004 in the two world championships in between now this Olympics. And uh, I just, I remember looking and being like, you don't get these opportunities um, that, you know, you work four years for this one moment and I just fallen short in like the worst of ways, like as a tie, right? So uh, I see this guy start taking his victory lap and, um, you know, at this moment, the reporters come up to you and stick their microphones in your face, like, how do you feel? And it's like, I see my wife come down and, and uh, from, she, she made it over to me and when I saw her, she was crying, which made me cry and then they stick these microphones in your mouth and say, okay, you've just spent the last four years of your life training for this moment and you just lost. How do you feel right now? And it's like, I, what I'd really like to do is take this <laughs> microphone. <laughs> so you, you do what you can and, and I made it through those. And um, the next day I started actually, it was the very next day I started hearing rumors that uh, he tested positive and I'd heard that at every major championship. Yeah. So I never put much credence in it. And then, um, and then uh, about uh, two weeks later, I get a call saying he tested positive. I'm like, yeah, I've heard that before. We'll see what happens. And I got a call actually about six months later saying he tested positive and that something was up. I'm like, well, what am I supposed to do with this information? 
in the subsequent time, my sponsor at the time had basically said, look, you're good enough for the first loser. Um, and they give me a, a contract offer, which my agent and I thought that we could do better uh, then. So we basically, I mean, it was, it was a horrible contract. I won't, I won't lie. It, it basically reduced every incentive that I had and left me with a flat uh, payment that was... Like a silver medal, you took a pay cut because of a silver medal. Substantial. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. And, 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 um, it's, a high, it's a high bar. Yeah. No, it's a high bar. So, um, so I was pissed. And um, I walked away from that contract and the company, we, we, were, we were talking to another company who said, hey, we've got to wait till our fiscal year ends and money opens up, but we're going to give you a contract and it was going to be this and this. So that would have been in February. They sent me a bunch of product and, and um, said, um, hey, this is a sign of good faith. I'm like, cool, no problem. February comes along, guy that I've been talking to gets fired. They replace him with another guy who hates throwers because they're all dirty, uh, his words. And uh, have since become a pretty good, he was, when I was competing the rest of my, he, we became pretty good friends. But, um, you know, it takes a while to change, to change a culture. And, um, but anyway, I was pissed. And so I now had no monetary reason to do this. And I woke up every day saying, fuck my sponsor, at the time my old sponsor, and that was my motivation. I, I literally would say, I would li no joke, I'd wake up and the first thing out of my head was, Fuck Nike. They didn't think I was good enough. But they didn't want to bet on me. Um, I was angry, angry. I trained angry every single day, every single day. And um, at some point, anger is not a sustainable emotion for me. I'm not that kind of guy. And uh, it reminded me of why I actually did this sport to begin with. And I'd gotten so caught up in like how much money some guy was making over here and some guy was making over here that I'd forgotten really what my motivation was, which was not money. I am not a person that's heavily motivated by it. Don't get me wrong. I, I like money, but it's not the reason why I initially choose to do this anyway. And so my, 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 my value system had gotten skewed. Uh, and, and I was really having a hard time justifying my, my self-worth uh, until this moment. And I can remember now, like looking back, I'm like, the greatest thing that was ever done for me was, was getting that silver and uh, the falling out with Nike. And since that time, I, I, I've become, you know, the guys at Nike, like, we're fine, we're good. The, they, they came and did a speech, and they said, the less your event looks like the 100, the mile, the marathon, the less I care about you. So you have to be exceptional. And I realized that my values, like how I valued myself, was not their value system because they're not part of the sport. They're a third party. And so my blame on them was like different. It shouldn't have been, I was angry at them, but I shouldn't have been angry at them. I should have been angry at the people that market the sport uh, and angry at myself for not doing better, for not becoming extraordinary, not doing something that is so undeniably amazing that uh, people can't hesitate, uh, people won't hesitate to, to invest in you. And so that year I woke up angry, 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 and then all of a sudden, I was happy, and I just, I loved it, and that transition took me right into the World Championships, and I ended up winning the World Championships in 2005 in Finland, and carried me for the next eight years, because I was like, I still have some unfinished business in this, and I'm not doing this for money, I'm doing this for my own personal gratification, and if the money happens, that's great, if not, I'm okay, and I know that sounds cheesy as hell, but like, if anger is your sustainable emotion, you're, you're a miserable, nasty person. If you're really serious about doing something, you've got to be passionate about it. And if that passion is not motivated by a general joy of what you do, like, then you're going to have some major issues to deal with down the road. And, and you're going to have some major regrets. And uh, I think for myself, when I made that transition as an athlete um, and really remembering why I do this and how I'm going to value myself, uh, I can't say that it was smooth sailing every day, but the big stuff, the little things anyway, didn't bother me. The big stuff, like, I could just deal with better. Um, so so you've, you've got this part of your career. You're throwing in, the, in, the, throwing in a shirt that yeah. says space for rent. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Sp sponsor, sponsor lists, throwing nomad. Yes. I remember you having... Yeah, you know, huge, huge throws that indoor yeah. season. Anger, and, baby. Yeah. Anger. I didn't say it wasn't effective. Yeah. Uh, 
Yeah, so I also had a shirt that said, at least my mom loves me. <laughs> um, yeah, that was sort of my mentality at the time. And, and I actually got in trouble for those shirts. Uh, the sponsorship rules around this profession yeah. of track and field limited the size of, of, uh, of logos and words on a, on a, on a shirt. Oh, yeah. And I remember having this conversation with one of the people that was trying to keep me from wearing the shirt. And I was like, well, he's like, don't you have a proper uniform? I'm like, this is my proper uniform. Well, you can't wear this out there. Why not? Because it has these, lo- these words on us. It. It's not a logo. It's a saying. <laughs> it's not for, you're not sponsored no, by the space uh, for no rent commercial, company. <laughs> yeah, there's no commercial entity involved with it. Well, you should cover it up. I'm not covering anything up. This is against the rules. Show me. And it was like all logo based. And they, but we ended up like I had, I mean, I had sponsor, I had sponsor companies complain to file, file grievances with USATF and the IAAF. And all these people would like shut this guy up because I was actually a thorn in their side. I wasn't trying to be at the time. But like the fact that a world champion or someone who's number one or number two could like compete and not have a sponsor. And I was trying to draw attention to that fact really didn't sit well with a lot of powers that be in the sport. And, uh, and my attitude was like, well, then do something about it. I'm not against a sponsorship, but I'm having problems finding one. So that's on you. Like you're failing at your job and we're failing at marketing me. So I'm going to draw attention to it. Anyway, I sold myself on eBay. I think I was the first person to do that. Some people have done it since then. And I got bought by a company called uh, Metavox RX, which was, uh, they had a, uh, Rex the talking pill bottle. Uh, it was aimed, <laughs> aimed at, uh, aimed at uh, folks with dementia and blind folks who, who had prescription pills and couldn't tell what they were uh, consuming. So they, uh, it had a talking pill bottle, which I thought was kind of cool. Um, but yeah. So you go through that time in your career and we get to, we get to 2012. You do the Olympic trials, but the, the, the part that I want to talk about yeah. more is you know, to circle back to these rumors of Bill and Og failing the drug test. In 2012, <clears throat> there's news. Let's take, take us through that time. So it's actually July of 2012, and I'd, I'd gotten hurt six weeks before the trials. I pulled a groin, and, and the, the, the one fight that you can't win uh, is father time. And the, the time to recover from a groin pull, pretty severe one, was just too great uh, for me at the time. I just I wasn't ready to compete. And then it, the Oregon did, a, did me a favor and opened up the skies and rain like the worst case scenario for me. And so my trials in 2012 were horrible. Um, and I got a call about two weeks after the trials and about three weeks before the uh, Olympics started in July from a reporter and she said, uh, have you heard anything? And I joke with people, I'm like, look, if a reporter asks you an open-ended question, your first response is, okay, tell me what you're talking, <laughs> give me a little more context here. So I was like, uh, what are we talking about? And she said, well, 100 samples from the 2004 Olympic Games have been, have been retested and five people have tested positive and it's rumored that one of the shot putters had and, and the rumor is that it's the Ukrainian athlete. So I haven't heard anything. Uh, and I didn't hear anything. And there's an eight-year statute of limitations on a retroactive drug test. Uh, that, had been on the, that was the statute at the time. And uh, so the 2012 Olympic trials go by, and I, or 2012 Olympics go by, and I, I still hadn't heard anything from anybody. And they said, uh, you know, I don't know, maybe two weeks after the Olympics are over, and I'm thinking, well, that was an interesting thought, you know. Yeah. But I'm a silver medalist. That's what, that's what I am. And... and and um, I get a call from a reporter, and uh, same reporter, and she says, have you heard anything? I said, well, we've been through this before. What are we talking about? And she said, they're supposed to announce today whether or not they're going to um, vacate or reallocate the medals. And I said, no, I haven't heard anything. And as soon as I said that, she said, oh, my God, they just made the announcement. You're the Olympic champion. So that's how I found out I was the Olympic champion. Um, the emotions that I experienced at that one moment, Chad, it's going to get me. <laughs> um, the emotions that you experience at that moment is, uh, I, I don't, I've never, I haven't really been able to, 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 to really define it. Um, and about a year later, it, I'll just, I'm going to fast forward through this, but about a year later, I got a call from an uh, official from the USOC saying they'd, they'd been able to secure the medal. And um, they wanted to do a medal exchange, and could I meet them at the Atlanta airport? Um, 
So I drove down to the Atlanta airport and we waited in the food court for this guy to come out. And uh, it was very, you know, unemotional, cold, sterile, relative as sterile as a food court can be. Um, and uh, I put, he said, did you bring your medal? I said, yeah, and I gave him my silver medal and he gave me the gold medal and we looked at each other and it was like, well, not much else to say at this moment, is there? Did he buy you like a Cinnabon or I, anything? You know, I did get a free toy with a, <laughs> with a Happy Meal. Um, it was out. Sure. There. It was actually so. I mean, did, did anyone in that food court know what was going on there? It's amazing. No. Um, in hindsight, I wish I'd actually called the local news and just said, "Let's let's just commemorate this," because that would have been a, a really interesting uh, video yeah. to have. Uh, but I remember, like, it didn't sink in until I was walking back to the car and I'm looking at this medal. I'm like, um, wow, I spent most of my adult life pursuing this little piece of gold, and um, I feel nothing. I feel loss. I feel anger. Uh, I'm like, uh, Olympic gold medal is not supposed to feel that way. Um, And uh, I got back to my house, and my wife had called everybody in the neighborhood, so they came and did like a surprise medal party for me, and um, I realized like those, those medals, those medals are just a physical representation of the work that went into it. And if you're not pre- pleased with the work that you put into something, those medals are not going to be something that have much value for you. Um, afterwards, there's a sentimental attachment because there's a response to that, receiving that one, one moment. And all of my all of my, um, all the value that I took from the 2004 Olympics was associated with a silver medal that I gave away because I wanted to make sure that the guy that earned the silver had the silver, and that was Joachim Olsen. Uh, Joachim is a fantastic guy uh, in Denmark, massively strong guy as well. Um, and um, so I felt like that was rightfully his. Uh, but it's taken me a long time to assign value to this gold medal. Um, it's um, what I come back to is like the importance of, of appreciating process versus the results because you can't guarantee the results. There's no guarantees at all. And that's actually very important within the Olympic mo- movement, the Olympic spirit. When Pierre de Coubertin, the founder of the modern Olympics, talked about it, he stressed the importance of the struggle because that's truly what's going to define who you are as a person, define your character and all that other stuff. And in every competition that, that we would ever have, in any competition, there's only going to be one winner, you know? And, and so what I had to look back is, like, what were the victories that I had along the way? Like, those are the only things that I can guarantee. Like, I can guarantee at the end of every day that I gave everything to pursuing this objective. And maybe I hit a new PR in something in training, or maybe I did this, or maybe I just had the best, you know, six-month block of training ever. That's a small victory. Those are the only things that you're guaranteed in life. Um, and so now I look at the gold medal. I'm like, you know what? This medal is more symbolic of the bigger issue, um, like drugs and sport, clean sport, and some of the other things that I think we're going to talk about too. But um, I, I really believe that, you know, look, I'm not going to discount the fact I think drugs do work. Like, there's no doubt. Like, you will get stronger. You will get faster. Whatever qual- training, athletic qualities you're training, they can enhance that. But... I also believe that for most of us, if you give yourself the time and create the right environment, you can achieve sustainable results uh, that are really, you know, I competed in a world of what people said was one of the dirtiest events in, in, in track and field and uh, did pretty well. And I can tell you that I never did drugs, uh, never thought about really doing them. I can't tell you that it didn't cross my mind at times because you're just around it. But like, it was never a serious consideration in my, in my, in my, in my mind to do it. And I feel like in, in some ways that gold medal is reflective of my process. Like that's what it is. And, and I used to joke with people at the time, I was like, you know, it's kind of like getting a, you know, it's a lifetime achievement award um, posthumously. Like there's value for others, but not necessarily for you in that medal. Uh, so I'm still trying to figure out what the value is there for me personally, but um, I, I feel like there's a, there's a symbolic value for, the, for, for, for this next generation of throwers um, that, they, that you know, we have these rules in place for a reason. 
uh, in that uh, if your process matches uh, the ideals, you're gonna, you have a chance to really uh, you know, excel. So with retroactive testing, you know, weightlifting is being ravaged by retroactive drug testing, right. almost to the point of not being included in the Olympics anymore. And in, 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 in track, I have two friends, you and Alicia Montano, who have both been very directly affected by this. She moved up mm -hmm. from fifth to third through retroactive testing in the 2012 Olympics. And, you know, from an emotional standpoint, obviously it's, it's very significant for you, and I know it was for her as well, but, but from a, you know, all that stuff about the sponsors and, 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 and everything, if it's a level playing field the day of, you're the gold medalist, and, and Nike is, oh my gosh, Adam Nelson, let's give him a bunch of money and, and do all this. And there's no way for them to compensate that part of your life, eight years of not being able to say, Adam Nelson, gold medalist, or Alicia Montano, bronze medalist, mm -hmm. and the, the, you know, what people want to pay you for speaking engagements and all these, these different things that, that come along with it. So it seems like retroactive testing, they, they have to do it, but it's, it's not quite right. Like what, what's the right answer and how they deal with this? Yeah, so I spent a lot of time actually trying to figure this out. And I, I feel like the, what we lack right now is alignment. Um, and alignment with all the stakeholders and what our core, core sort of values are. Uh, the justifiably so, the doping control is separate from the, from the, from the sports organizations because it eliminates any conflicts of interest there. Um, and uh, I don't have a problem with that, but the, that, so right now doping control works independently from everything else in the sport. And I believe it's done that way uh, for a lot of reasons. One, because it serves the people that are in power at the doping control agencies, uh, and as well as the federations, the sports federations themselves, because they can, they can point the finger at somebody else. Um, and, and it doesn't sort of, there's, there's no crossover here. Um, uh, when there's a failure, it's, it's usually on the doping control side, and the IAAF or the federations can say, we're doing everything we can to support it. This is just bad drug testing or bad whatever. So they can point, again, assign blame where, where uh, it's assigned blame elsewhere. But from my perspective, I think if we're really serious about this, we have to combine, uh, we have to cr come up with a strategy that integrates all of the different stakeholders in, in, in creating a solution. There's no incentive for, uh, for like, People are like, well, you know, Nike gets beat up a lot in track and field because they basically sponsor the whole sport. Without Nike, there is no such thing as the pseudo profession of track and field. They put in twice as much money as any other sponsor into the sport, combined, actually, I believe. Uh, so, but Nike is not track and field. Nike is not the Olympic Games. They're, they are accountable to their stakeholders, which are not the federations. They are the people that own Nike. And they're about, we want to see top line growth that translates to bottom line, the bottom line uh, increase, right? They want to see revenues increase. They want to see net profitability improve. Uh, that's what they want because that's what their stakeholders want. And so, but there is a way to align the stakeholders together around specific, like, behavioral issues, if you will. And it's honestly about, uh, in my opinion, like, I think the athletes need to come together and say, this is what we want. This is what we're willing to give away in return for this particular system where everybody's aligned around these values. So if in a situation, I, I used to call it the fair play fund uh, when I talk about it, but the way it would work is that a percentage of every dollar that goes into the sport or an individual or a coach or whatever uh, would go towards creating this uh, deferred compensation plan that, um, that uh, if you achieved eight years or 10 years or whatever it is as a clean athlete, you would then pull, you'd be able to withdraw from it. So it works like a retirement plan, if you will, or, or vesting, there's a vesting schedule there. And now everybody's al aligned around this, 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 this goal financially as well of, of clean sports, if that's what it is, if that's what the issue is. And I, there's been a lot of hesitancy there's been a lot of resistance to that type of concept because it, it would require people to, to give away power to athletes to, to dictate their own rights and, and what, those, what the limitations are on those rights and how they expect to be treated in these situations. On one hand, it's very pro, 
clean sport. On the other hand, it's also pro athletes' rights because there's always a duality here, right? If I improve my testing, um, then that's going to come at the cost. If I change the testing protocols, that's going to come at the violation of athletes' rights. As an athlete, we're under surveillance basically 24 hours a day, 365 days a year. And they want blood, they want urine, they want hair. I mean, they don't want hair samples yet, but I mean, it's all coming. Oh, yeah, well, that's, you know, it's all good. You beat the system. <laughs> There's other places they can pull from, right? Um, but uh, it's, it's fascinating. So I, like, I, I still feel like the, the drug testing, the way drug testing is currently set up, it's not set up for the greatest chance of success. If you're really trying to change the culture, you can't just like have this freaking stick out here that just is out here like playing whack-a-mole, right? You've got to go back in and say, okay, we want to change the culture. How are we going to do that? Well, why don't we make sure everybody's compensation is aligned with what, what our objectives are? In order to do that, we have to actually recognize the athletes who we've always seen as the problem, but they're also the solution. It ha works in every other sport that has a, a professional athletes association. So um, that's, that's, where, that's where I think it needs to go. Um, but, uh, you know, you, I've been on a wall on that for a long do time. You think there's a, do you think there needs to be some kind of cultural shift even? I mean, we used to, you used to be familiar with, like, the whole Russian, you know, basically doping machine that exists that that culture needs to change in order to make, to make, being a clean athlete, an actual concept that that's believable or that's, sure. that's like, you know, I think maybe for so long, you know, certain countries have, have just been they're They're mired in this world of like, well, you know, we just first day in the gym, first pill you take, like that's how it goes. And, yeah. and so that culture is just, they can't conceive anything outside of that. So you think like, do you think, I guess, at all the world can get to that point where they maybe believe like you or like a lot of American athletes, um, you know, that being a clean athlete is a viable method to winning gold medals? Yeah. Uh, yes, I do. Uh, and all we have to do is enforce the rules that are in place. Um, at some point, you know, we know which countries are non-compliant. Um, and this is just a question of saying, hey, look, there's a penalty for being non-compliant. The greatest mistake that the IOC and WADA made over the last four years was allowing Russian athletes to compete. And I'm sorry that there were some athletes that were, the, the clean athletes that may, or may, or may have been clean athletes, that, that got taken out, that, that would have been impacted negatively by that. But the bottom line is, every single one of those athletes has an opportunity to come forward right. and, and, and point. Now, I know that that's, that's very easy to say in our environment, and, and like there's a lot more risk. I don't blame the athletes for that point, for, for, for not coming forward and saying something's going on here because they risk everything. They risk everything. And the IOC has proven time and time again that they really don't have your back. So, um, but at the end of the day, if you would go to the non-compliant countries and say, look, you're not compliant. All of your athletes are gonna be banned tomorrow for nine months, a year from all competition. Uh, and you're going to have to pay a fine. People say, well, that's not fair economically for a lot of these countries. Okay, you can make an exception, which quickly will then become the rule, or you can change the rules and make it actually something that you can actually like monitor and support. We have rules that are in place that, we, that they're just there. There's nobody that can enforce them. Uh, because there's no, there's no financial resources to do that. So like, we have a system that's not set up for success. And we've got bureaucrats and people that say, well, this is this and this, blah, blah, blah. But at the end of the day, the reason why Russia was allowed to compete and, in, 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 I mean, this, it was a fucking joke um, at this, at this uh, Winter Olympics. Like, the reason why they're able to compete is because there's only three or four countries in the world that can truly pay for an Olympic Games now. Yeah. Russia is one of them. And, and so to say that, like, the IOC doesn't want to, risk losing that, burning that bridge for the next 20 or 30 years is a very true statement. Yeah. So they're going to do things that makes it look like we're being really tough, but if you dig down below the surface, like it's, it's, it's crap. The bottom line is like if you treated every stakeholder the same way you treated athletes, the individual, like you wouldn't have any problem. All right, so we, we have 2012 Olympic trials, frustrating with the injury. You were retired from competing at that time. Yeah. Correct. A year later, the pomp and circumstance of receiving your 
nine year retroactive gold medal in at, at a Chick Fil A in the it was Burger King. Okay, actually. Burger King. Yeah. If it would have been Chick Fil A, that would have been pretty good. Yeah. But yeah, in the Atlanta airport. Uh, yeah, I, I got to reconnect with you summer of 2014, uh, where we were both speakers at Sorenex Summer Strong mm -hmm. uh, event. Went out to dinner, talked all kind of training. Very, very fun, fun time. And we we stayed connected after that, but not talking about training so much. Talking about business and marketing and, and all this kind of stuff. S late, maybe fall, mm -hmm. early fall, late summer 2015, my phone rings, Adam Nelson, always excited for, for the call. And I pick it up expecting you know, some marketing type of, of questions. And Adam called me and asked and, and said, I want to start throwing the shot put again. Like, will you coach me or will, will I help him train in in what is likely the coolest moment of my coaching career i got to accept the job of coaching consulting advising my you know childhood shot putting hero on his training to return to competing at the tw with the goal of the 2016 olympic trials it should be your sixth consecutive olympic trials and you were 40 or 41 at that i was turning 40 yeah at, at 40 years old. So to do this special thing, what made you want to, yeah. what made you want to come back to competing and, and, and do all of that? Yeah. So it's, it's, it's funny. I, I mean, I, I hadn't touched a shot. I mean, I touched it a couple of times in the intermittent period, but like basically, um, like, like the weight room throwing is a drug for me too. Um, I, I really, I, you know, some people like golf and some people like to go jog and run and, and as weird as it sounds like I actually genuinely enjoy going out and throwing a shot put and as much as I try to deny it I'm like I've got other stuff to do I don't have time to go out <laughs> to the circle I don't have time it, every two or three years if I've been away from it I've got to go and it just happened two weeks ago um, I hadn't touched a shot since the Olympic trials I was like I, I really feel like I want to go out and throw today are you about and, to announce another 2020 trials? Exclusive. <laughs> right here. You heard it first. Uh, I haven't touched it since then. But um, no, I, I don't know. I mean, look, I wouldn't rule it out of the realm of possibilities. Like, I, I feel like, um, I just, I, I really feel like there's a couple of things that go on here. Like, one, it's something that I truly enjoy doing. And as much as I try to deny it, because there's really no, like, it's, I mean, our community is really small, right? So it's like just a bunch of weird people. Um, that I love, I, I don't call them weird, but I think everybody else that looks at them are like, you guys are just weird. I don't know if I should feel threatened or safe. One of the two, you know, <laughs> like we're all big and loud and, but I go in there and there's just something that's just, it, it's just soothing to me. Um, and, uh, if golf would not be that way for me. And so I don't know, I, I, I I'd been training a couple of kids and I had gone up and trained this one guy up in New Jersey and his dad was like, dude, you got to throw, you got to throw, you got to throw. And so I remember it was a few months before that and I was still in a 12 pound shot and uh, he's like, take a couple of throws, do it. I'm like, dude, I haven't touched a shot in like forever and I'm, I'm going to hurt myself. And it was like 32 degrees in New Jersey and um, we shoveled out the snow and all that stuff. But we'd been out there for an hour going at it and I was having fun, like coaching the kid and I was trying to talk smack to him. And I stepped in the ring and, and cold and all that other stuff. Like, I think I threw the 12-pound shot, like, that day, like, I don't know, 75 or 76 feet. And I was like, hmm. <laughs> we'll see what happens. <laughs> so it was a seed that got planted and then slowly just started to cultivate a little bit more. And then I, I was like, well, let me just start with the lifting. And that was, like, why I reached out to you is I, I, I really did love um, the, the structure of the programs that I'd seen you put out through Juggernaut. And then I'd seen... Um, or JTS, I mean, same, same. Um, but, uh, and I, I just loved all the content that you put out through, through, through the site and some other things. And I was like, I'd love to just learn and see what I can do. And it gives, gives me something that I can direct our training to. Um, so I'm probably a horrible person, a horrible athlete to coach though. Cause I, <laughs> uh, I'm, I'm sure Chad was like, oh, so it was, it was definitely the most nerve wracking program I'd ever written. I was like, did not screw this one up, Chad. Best program you've ever written. Best program you've ever written. Come on. <laughs> yeah. So, so we go through this process, you know, training probably 
10, 10 months a year yeah. back training towards towards Olympic trials. Yeah. And things are starting to pick up and you're, th you're throwing far. And, and we go to Eugene, Track Town, USA, um, summer of 2016. Yeah, what, what was really fun for me and flattering and all that stuff, when we went to dinner with uh, you know, your wife and kids and, and your parents, I got to eat a ton of P.F. Chang's, which I always enjoy. That was an extra bonus. <laughs> <laughs> and just kind of be a part of this, this experience, this, this really cool life, life experience. Yeah and the night before the competition. And then we go the next day, first day of Olympic trials. At the Olympic trials, they have uh, an opening ceremony, like a mini version of, uh, of the Olympic Games. And there was a surprise at that ceremony. I'm gonna make you say it, because I, when I tell, I, I tell this story to people and I get emotional, so I'm gonna make Adam do it instead. Um, so, this was one of the other things. It was in February that year that the, um, the organizers had said, hey, look, we want to do something special for you because we think you got totally screwed. And um, so they called and said, look, we want to recognize you at the, at the uh, Olympic trials this year. And, and I said, okay, that's okay, I'll, I'll go. And that also solidified my decision to go compete too. I was like, I want to be there anyway. Got to do it, right? Uh -huh. um, but I didn't know what they were going to do. And then... Um, I knew what time it was going to happen. It was during the opening ceremonies. And, um, and so I, I go, and they pull me back into this little back room kind of thing, and I walk up to these stairs, and there's a big podium that's, like, elevated above the whole stadium, and it's got this big jumbotron behind it. Um, and uh, they play the national. They, they basically bring me up for an award for a medal ceremony, like a proper medal ceremony. And they, the, I think one of the senators from Oregon gave me the medal, and... I you know, had a whole laurel wreath and all the all the stuff that you would have at the at the at the stadium and the Olympics, and uh, they play the national anthem and a big I don't know yeah. a B one bomber or something it was massive comes flying right over and does a flyby right at the right at the finish of of the of the national anthem and um, you know I said earlier like I didn't really know what the value was with this gold medal and for four years, five years, like I had no value. So there was no memory, nothing positive that was really associated with it. And here was an opportunity for me to get recognized in front of my peers in front of like track town USA. And uh, still while I was competing so my daughters could feel it and see it. Yeah, and, and while your daughters uh, were old enough to kind of understand what was yeah. like, oh, you know, daddy, he spins around in the circle and throws yeah. the ball. But I think that, that they were old yeah. enough then to sort of so Get what was going on? And... Uh, I mean, it was it was awesome. I wore sunglasses for a reason, <laughs> um, but like those are the that's those are the moments that you can't replace when you don't have that mom medal ceremony in the moment. And and I think that that's ultimately like when you're when I was thinking about what's the the capstone to my Olympic career, I always had that medal ceremony as like that would be the perfect thing, like to hear the national anthem uh, and then be done. And um, the uh, the coolest part of that game, the sorry, That's the damn story. it! This is why I do do it. <laughs> so the coolest part of that whole thing, that thing um, it's all good, man. Thank you. But we said we were gonna hug. <laughs> um, the coolest part of that whole event to me um, was when one of the young shot putters, younger shot putters, Joe Kovacs, came up to me after I threw because I threw right after that. And uh, he said, I just want to say it was an honor to compete against you in the first time that you've been announced as the Olympic champion in, uh, in a competition. So um, when he said that, I was like, I hadn't thought about it. And um, I don't know, maybe it was what I was trying to find um, maybe, maybe that was the moment that I was waiting for or that I was, that would certainly add value to, uh, something that had been void of, of it. Um, but, uh, it was at that moment that I really appreciated the fact that I'd had this process that lived up to my value system that eventually rewarded, rewarded me with the opportunity to compete with a bunch of young kids who saw me compete when they were 12 or eight or 
however long because I'm old. And um, that uh, at some level I'd inspired them to do things in a way that uh, they hopefully will never have to experience what I have. Um, that they will, you know, be rewarded in the moment. And um, yeah, so it was uh, it was pretty cool. The whole day was surreal, but I think that's the that's the memory that I take away from it more than anything else is uh, being able to actually compete and be recognized as the Olympic champion, uh, which I'd never been able to do. And um, that was pretty awesome. Yeah, it was it's one of my, yeah, coaching, whatever, just one of my favorite memories is seeing that happen. Lacey's crying, your, your girls are excited, your mom's crying, your dad's there. I'm, I'm getting emotional in the stands, and at the same time, the coach in me is seeing you on the, on the big screen getting teared up. I'm like, shit, he's got to throw in like 40 minutes, guys. We can't, we can't <laughs> be having this cathartic experience right before it's time to throw. But uh, go on, throw about 67-6-ish there. Yeah, 67-6-ish. Uh, it wasn't my best. Uh, I would have liked to have, it, I would have appreciated it, like, had it been about two or three weeks earlier. I was in, I think, a little bit better shape, but, like, um, all things considered, like, you know, when you walk out, like, there's a, there's a old, like, there's a story about, like, doing your best, right? Like, when, when you look at, not to, I know I can be long-winded with some of my stories, so I'll just say this one time, real quick. I had this opportunity to meet Tommy Lasorda in the 2000 Olympic trials, and he said something that was really powerful to me. There's a difference between trying and doing. I won't get into the full anim like the animation of the whole story, but there's a difference between trying and doing. Losers try and winners do. When you try something, when you try your best at something, you're basically putting a disclaimer on the results. Uh, when you do something, when you do something, you're committed to it, and you say, this is what I'm going to do. Whatever the results are, you may not necessarily be happy with, but you can accept because you didn't leave anything on. You, you, didn't, you didn't hold back. You committed wholeheartedly to that. And um, so I, I, I literally, you know, I walked off the field and I, like I would have loved to have a storybook ending and make one more Olympic Games and, and do that. But, um, you know, realistically, I think that probably would have dis been a disservice to the guys that were actually training full time for it. <laughs> it, it, it was a, pretty, it was a pretty, good, pretty good squad that made so, the Olympics there. Yeah, they were, they were solid. <laughs> yeah. Um, but, uh, yeah, I, I, I walked off the field and I was like, you know what? I did the best I could over the balance of my career and... I've got nothing that I need to do now, so um, it felt it felt great. I mean, I saw you afterwards, and yeah, I mean, I, I'm I'm forever grateful for being able to be included in that experience. It was it was amazing. So, and yeah, you know, I didn't get to be out there throwing like like Joe, but the same way as a young shot putter, like you were incredibly inspiring to me. And every video I could watch and watching the meets on TV and YouTube and all and all that stuff it was it was awesome so thank thank you for that whole lifetime of enjoyment watching cool thank you um <laughs> let's talk about what you're what you're doing now tell us a yeah. little bit about uh the d10 and then we'll wrap things up yeah sure so uh the d10 at its at face value is a sports event we put on an nfl combine cell uh competition that uh attracts a bunch of executive and corporate athletes guys that maybe may have been college or professional athletes uh as well we had some guys that have been you know two or three years in the league or something like that, but now moved on to like banking or consulting or whatever they do now. Um, and ultimately we raise money for pediatric oncology research and treatment. Uh, it's, I've had a hard time transitioning from, from sports into uh, my professional career, post-athletic career, because there was always some non-material value associated with what I was doing before. There was like a, whether it was a social good or, or that I saw, whether it was real or not, uh, or whether it was some non like sort of materialistic value like there was always something there that I was doing and as I shifted away from sports I, I was like I need to find something that has the ability to give back and still you know pay the bills and that's that's a challenge and um, you know I work with a company right now where we uh, put on you know four five six events a year depending on the year uh, and this year we started off our first event by raising 1.5 million dollars for Memorial Sloan Kettering uh, and their Children's Cancer Center. And 
it, the money's cool. Like, don't get me wrong. Like, it's great to raise that, but then you hear about the impact of that of that effort, and it's like, uh, on balance, like to treat a kid, it's you know seven or eight thousand dollars, maybe a little more, maybe a little less, depending on the treatment. So you can kind of do the quick math. Let's just round it up to ten thousand. You're like, wow, we treated 150 kids uh, with this event, and that's pretty freaking awesome. Um, so it's it's something I I I I joke. I'm like one of these days I'm I, with my with my partner. I'm like I'm gonna get my my, my people to come in and compete and just blow the records away. <laughs> um, but there's some legit records. Like we use we do a, a bench rep test with 175. I, I kind of laugh at some of those records there. I think it's like 45 or 47 now. The pull up record is actually pretty legit at 47 reps. It was done this week uh, this this last uh, this two weeks ago. Um, we got a guy that, that uh, who was a former bobsledder and uh, he played pro football for a year or two. Who uh, we added the broad jump this year and he did 10-6. So that's a pretty legit broad jump. Yeah. Um, but no, it's it's been a lot of fun just to kind of be in a related field and and actually use sports to to drive social impact, which is pretty awesome. Where can people learn more about uh, D10? The D10.com. Um, we have a. Uh, our next events in Chicago in August, and then we'll be in San Francisco and finish off here in Houston. They're about six weeks apart, so um, yeah. All right, very cool. So this was the Jug Life podcast. Thanks for watching, for listening. If you enjoy it, go on iTunes, give us a five star review. Make sure to subscribe to our YouTube channel. Three plus videos a week. Uh, thanks to the world's strongest videographer, Shorty Sedang. You're interested in coaching, powerlifting, weightlifting, strongman, super total and power building, or if you're a 40-year-old guy who needs to go to his sixth Olympic trials, visit <laughs> juggernautcoaching.com, and uh, we have programs for all levels. Um, yeah, beyond that, I think only event upcoming to sign up for, the Juggernaut Performance Summit. Max and I, along with Dr. Mike, Dr. Quinn, and Dr. James, will be on Long Island on August 19th, talking about technique, programming, nutrition, mobility, and recovery. So pretty much all the important stuff to being a successful athlete. You can sign up for that and get some CEUs through the NSCA as well. Adam, where can they find you on social media and get all that good stuff? Uh, so the d10.com is the best way to figure out what I'm doing. Uh, social media is uh, obscure. Adam Nelson, uh, at Adam Nelson 5376. I don't know why that name, <laughs> uh, that's just what the Instagram assigned me. Um, Adam Nelson, 2251. Come on. Man. I know. I just, Come I, on. I was, I was not that adept at, at, at social media. We got to get, the, brand, we gotta get the branding down. So uh, I'm still working on that part. That's why I call you, man. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but yeah, you can reach me anyway there. Right. And, or you can go to Chad and say, Hey, can I talk to Adam? And he'll probably give you my number. Cause yeah. he just does that. You got a FaceTime call going. It'll be a, it'll be a whole thing. <laughs> Max. Uh, you can find me on Instagram, Max underscore Ada on Facebook, or you can email me maxjtsstrength.com. And I'm Chad Wesley Smith at Chad Wesley Smith and at Juggernaut Train on Facebook and Instagram. One of my favorite episodes, but my favorite episode. Yeah. I think he's even surpassed I Jack think, and Clark. Yeah, which is a big <laughs> Very praise. True. Yeah. Uh, thanks for watching, and we'll see you next week.